On episode 395 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Elizabeth Ryder and discuss her book, The Health Habit. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 395. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Our guest today is a leading nutrition and whole living expert, teaching women around the world how to become the healthiest, most successful versions of themselves. Elizabeth's healthy recipes and straightforward nutrition advice draw millions of inspired readers to her popular blog and Elizabeth Eats show on FM TV. With no further ado, here is Elizabeth Ryder. Elizabeth, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Hey, thanks for having me. You know, I'm really excited to talk about your book, uh, Health Habit, Seven Easy Steps to Reach Your Goals and Dramatically Improve Your Life. And kind of the subtitle of that is actually what is so attractive to me because I, I know from experience at working myself and with my clients is once something becomes a habit, it's, it's just this automatic thing that you do and it makes staying healthy so much easier the more of these health based things that you stack on top of each other. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to, to you about this book in particular, and then about habits and, and kind of approaches here. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks. I love talking about habits. I'm all about habits that people enjoy. So this, the book was really a quest for me with my online audience and now my book to find, to find a way to build habits that we truly enjoy and look forward to and not create something that feels too restrictive or like a prison every day. So this book is 10 years in the making and I'm really excited to share with everyone. And, and and yes, uh, with 10 years, 10 years in the making. Wow. But it's, it's very well put together. It's very well structured. It's a very easy read. I I really enjoyed that part of it too. Oh, thank you. Like you're, you're just kind of your common sense approach that if we go at this too restrictive, uh, we're setting ourselves up. Yeah. I mean, I've been a health coach for, oh gosh, um, seven or eight years now. And I've been blogging for over 10. I started blogging before, Instagram was even invented before influencers were a thing. I've just been blogging for a long time, which led me to do, um, to host online programs. And this book really came from pouring over the feedback forms of over 10,000 women who have done my online programs and really trying to get at the root of, we know how to be healthy, right? We know that every woman on the planet knows that blueberries are better for you than Snickers, (laughs) We know how to be healthy, but why is it? Why does it feel hard, and why aren't we doing it? And really, when I pour over the feedback forms, the overwhelming majority was that people, just women, especially I think men too, but you know I work mostly with women, feel so restricted, and that they know they can stick to a quote diet for a short period of time, but they always fall off. So, what I what my work has been is how do I help these women build habits into their daily life? based on what they already enjoy, instead of just prescribing a completely new way of living, because that's, you know, that's difficult for people. Again, we can, anybody can do anything for a week or even 28 days, you know, a certain period of time, but we eventually slide backwards into old habits. So instead of prescribing a completely new lifestyle, how can I help you look at your current lifestyle and just make tweaks to make it healthier? Yeah. Most people, you know, when, when they're going to make a change, so they say, okay, I, I want to get healthy or the doctor tells them, you know, hey, you need to lose some weight or there's a family member that that gets sick and, and has a chronic disease and they're like, okay, I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, so they kind of have this immediate kind of wake up and then they're going to set goals for themselves. But we, we suck at getting to our goals. Uh, <laughs> so in the book, you talk about four reasons that we're not meeting our goals. Do you mind going over those four reasons? Yeah, no, I'm happy to. For me, what I've noticed with people with goals is, and I have a business background. I came from corporate America before I became a health coach. And what I started to notice, (laughs) yeah, what I started to notice was, and I think this process works in all areas of life, but what I was noticing in health, especially is a woman would say like, 
I would say, well, what's your goal? And she would say, well, I want to lose 15 pounds or I want to sleep better or I want more energy. And those are great places to start. So it's not telling people, no, you're wrong, but really at the root of it, those are desired outcomes and goals need to be daily and actionable. And we learn this in the context of business. Smart goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And we don't need to get businessy, you know, in the context of our daily habits, but we do need to set daily actionable goals. So you still want to have an outcome in mind. If it is, you know, you know, you feel better at a certain weight and you want to achieve that. If you just need more energy during the day, if you want to sleep better, if you want to reverse symptoms of a condition that you have, those are all great places to start with their outcomes. And we need to work backwards and figure out what are the daily actionable goals that you can have to actually achieve that. So for instance, if somebody wanted to lose weight, a daily, an example of a daily actionable goal would be no matter what the first thing you eat in the morning has to be low in sugar. Because if you spike your blood sugar in the morning, it's proven that you can eat up to two to three times more food during the day or engaging in time-restricted eating, which is a horrible word. It's a form of intermittent fasting. It's way easier than it sounds. Just reducing that window, not reducing the amount of food you eat, but reducing the window during the day in which you eat your food. For instance, you eat from like 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then you're done eating at 6 p.m. and then you don't eat again until 9 a.m. the next day. So you're just giving a longer window for that fast that we do overnight. And in the book, there's a ton of resources and ideas to meet a variety of different goals. But I, I want people to get out of the idea that a goal is this like big accomplishment that at the end of something, and we don't even know how to get there. The goals have to be daily and actionable. So that's the first thing is just people confuse outcomes with daily actionable goals. Yeah. And I, I liked in the book you, you talked about, so, so basically we have, we have what, what we call, I guess, desires, and then we take that over to actions and then we have outcomes. And so uh, if your goal is desire bound or outcome bound, it makes it that much more nebulous and difficult for you to know that you're on track. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, the second mistake I talk about with people is that they misunderstand the feeling that they desire. So any action we take is is driven by desire. And I think sometimes on the surface, if and I'll use, I don't, you know, I, I'll just tell you a side note real quick. I really did not want to write a weight loss book. And I intentionally wanted to keep this book out of the weight loss category because I think women are bombarded with this idea that we have to lose weight. And it's generally not true. However, I think that we all know as individuals that potentially we feel better at a certain weight, or there's been a time in our lives when we felt better at a certain weight and there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm kind of neutral to weight loss. It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And and you can have your own desires, but um, I intentionally wanted to keep this book out of the weight loss category. And Amazon chooses the categories, the author and the publisher do not uh, choose the categories it goes into. And of course, the first category it went into is the weight loss category. So, uh, you know, we can't control everything and that's fine. But um, so I'm using weight loss as an example here, but you could use these for, you know, energy or sleep or any, any of the other things that we talked about. But when it comes to weight loss specifically, I think a lot of women think that they desire weight loss because that they'll feel better. You know, they'll, they'll have higher self-confidence or something will happen. And then we lose the weight or something happens. And then we realize that it didn't meet any of the desire. We don't feel the way we thought that we would. And when it comes to weight loss specifically, I think focusing on vanity is not a bad thing. It might be like the first thing that you think of, like, I, I want to look a certain way in my clothes, which again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it has to be driven by a deeper desire to feel good. I know for myself, if, if, if I let vanity drive any of my goals, they all, they all fizzle out. So really understanding what do you desire? How do you want to feel? Do you want to feel confident? Do you want to feel accomplished? And I go through a lot of different um, desired feelings in the book. So you can really determine how you want to, how you desire to feel, because that will drive what your daily action habits are. Yeah. You know, I, I, I try to tell my clients, you know, vanity, vanity is not bad when it's, it's based on work that you've done. So if you've gone out and spent 20 weeks uh, of, of training your body, of watching what you eat, and you've gotten to a, you know, body composition that you're just really, really proud of, be proud. Uh, but the the vanity that it, you see a lot of times uh, on, particularly on the social media, where they're comparing themselves to someone else, you know, that's often kind of the struggle is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to look like, uh, you know, Dwayne Johnson, no matter how much training I do. Right. Uh, you know, but that said, I can be a better person myself and I can feel better about myself if I'm doing the right things for myself. 
Absolutely. And vanity, I'll just say, I think women, women, especially, I know I've had this internal struggle a lot and I've talked to a lot of women about this and it's taken me a while to overcome it. But, you know, on the surface, we start to feel like, oh, vanity is bad. So once we, once we kind of say, okay, I can't just be driven by vanity, then we start to, we swing the other way and we think that vanity is bad. And really just like weight loss, it's, I, I hope that women can come to a more neutral men to a more neutral position where vanity is part of your biology in the sense of not, you know, putting mascara on and lipstick and that type of vanity, but all animals groom themselves. You know, when we look a certain, when we look healthy, when we look a certain way, it attracts a, a mate and that's a biological process. It's ingrained in us to want to look good. And so I just want women to know, like, it's not, it's not bad to want to look good. It's just part of your biology. It's like you just said, it's not going down that comparison rabbit hole because Hey, look, I, I'm friends with a lot of Instagram influencers and I know that they take 500 shots to get the exact <laughs> right pose to get it, to get yeah. it right. Hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with that too, but we can't compare ourselves to that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then they, they dehydrate themselves and, and, and fast for three days before they do a photo shoot. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah. So we gotta, we've got to be realistic. Um, another area you went into the, in the book that I really enjoyed was you started talking about vision boards. Could you get a little into that? Oh yeah. I, I mean, visualization is a proven technique to help you achieve what those desired outcomes and goals are. It's what, you know, if we, even at a higher level, like Olympic athletes are, are coached to visualize themselves winning because it is proven that that can help accelerate their, their progress. So visualization is so important when something is in our mind, we gravitate towards it. I mean, the most simple example, we know this, if like, if I tell you today, oh, I'm really into red cars. Now, all of a sudden, when you're on the road, you're going to notice a lot of red cars, right? Because it becomes, it comes to the forefront of our mind. So anything that you look at all day, every day, and this is why your environment is so important. I talk about this, your environment in the book as well. If you are in an environment where there is a bowl of candy on the counter all day or at your desk or whatever it is, you're looking at it all day. Of course, it's going to be the only thing on your mind. You're looking at it all day. A vision board is a similar thing where when you can take what you want to achieve and actually physically put it in front of you, your mind will naturally gravitate towards whatever it is that you've put up there. Yeah. Like if you visualize yourself being able to scoop your grandchild up when they come to visit over the summer and be able to walk the zoo with them with, with no, you know, to, not without having too much fatigue where you're just pooped out and have to sit on the bench. You know, yep. those are visions that you can have for yourself. And, and then they're going to somewhat manifest in the activities that you start doing because that's what you're, that's what you're preparing yourself for. It's more like training than work. Yeah, absolutely. Now you use a concept in the book that I just adore. <laughs> it's, it's, it's called the quali- uh, qualitarian. Yes. And so it's, it's effectively saying, you know, however you're, you're choosing to eat like as a way of eating, be it keto or vegan or some of the other things that you might use like Mediterranean or dash or all those different titles or labels uh, that we have for the different diets that are out there. Uh, And most of them diets are intended. Okay. You're going to do this for a while and then you're going to quit, but you're looking at it more from the lifestyle perspective. And that leads us to qualitarian. What is it? And you have some commanding principles that I think are really crucial for us to know. Yeah. The qualitarian way is, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been a health coach for a long time. I've literally seen every diet and eating style available. And something I'll talk about really quickly. I talk about this in the book and people can go through this to determine which one they are. But before the qualitarian way, even just understanding, are you an abstainer or a moderator? Because one of the biggest problems right now that I see in health and wellness is that coaches don't understand the difference between somebody who does well in an abstainer model and somebody who does well in a moderator model. And if somebody gets into a program that like, if you're a moderator and you are trying to follow an abstainer way, it's going to be very difficult. And same the opposite way. If you're an abstainer and somebody's trying to tell you to moderate, it's going to feel difficult. And really you just can determine that by which one makes you feel more free. So an abstainer would be somebody that follows something like the whole 30 or vegan or some, a very strict diet label that you feel more free with fewer choices. And some people feel that way. And I I'm sure there are people listening to this right now that are going, yeah, yeah, I do feel better when I, I have a very strict rules that feels good to me. I know exactly what I'm doing. I like that black and white structure. And then there that, are people that actually describes me. I'm an abstainer. Okay, great. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. And then there are people, I'm a moderator. There are people like me who that makes me feel so 
heavy and restricted. And it makes me feel like I'm in prison. I hate that feeling. I do really well in a moderator model where it makes me feel more free to know, like, I'm going to follow a certain way of eating a quality and I'm going to eat real food, high quality food. And occasionally if I want to have pizza, I'll still have really high quality pizza, you know, made from the best ingredients, but I don't, if I have one slice of pizza, I'm good. That makes me feel more free. I don't need to have more, right? I don't, it doesn't, it's not the model of like, you can't just have one. I'm like, yeah, I actually can just have one, <laughs> um, but everyone's different. So like you yeah, just said, no, you're I'm, like, oh, I'm no. eating, I'm eating half or the whole pizza, just depending on how good it tastes. So yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so really determining, you know, which, which model do you fall under? And because if you're a moderator, like I don't label my eating habits. I think if somebody hung out with me for the week, they would think I was vegan because most of the food I eat is vegan. I gravitate towards that. I really don't do dairy or animal products. However, I might be out at dinner with a girlfriend, um, you know, and have a glass of wine. We might share like a flatbread or something. And, and that feels good to me. But some people, like you just said, you're an abstainer, you know, that is, you just like the black and white rules that feels better to you. So really we have to find which of those things work better for us. And then within that model, the qualitarian way means that no matter what, whatever food you decide to consume, whether it's, you know, your salad or your pizza or, you know, your bowl, your smoothie, that you choose the highest quality food that you have access to. Meaning one thing that I see a lot, and I think you know this too, everybody's on the gluten-free bandwagon and Hey, I don't eat a lot of gluten either, but what happens is people end up buying gluten-free junk food, right? Yeah. And, and gluten-free junk food is still junk food, you know, packaged, processed, just because it's gluten-free doesn't mean it's not made with stabilizers and preservatives and denatured oil and high amounts of sugar. Yeah. I've, so, I've watched this cycle so many times, you know, something will come out like gluten-free or like keto. And so this, this, this idea comes out and everybody wants to try it. And then all of a sudden you start seeing the freezer section and your grocery store has a little section of it now, and then it gets bigger and bigger. And then there's a whole section over, you know, what they call the health food section, where you're going to have all of these keto friendly foods or these gluten free foods. And you look at the label and it's, it's not food anymore. It's, it's, it's basically yeah. manufactured um, calories. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, under the qualitarian model, the qualitarian way, I think the most important question to ask, whether it's plant-based or animal-based, what's the quality of this food? Am I eating the highest quality food that I have access to? And when I say that I have access to, you know, I've lived all over the world um, and all over the U S and right now I'm currently on the coast in Seattle, big cities have access to more food. And I realize that I'm from a small town in Montana. And I realize that not every single place in the world has access to, uh, you know, free range, uh, air chilled chicken, right. Or whatever it is that you want to eat. So, and budgets are also a concern. So whatever it is, um, and I give a lot of tips for, you know, budgeting and eating well on budgets in the book, but just choosing the highest quality food you can. Yeah. I think that's critical. If it's not whole food, um, you have to, you know, you have to realize that it was manufactured to, uh, to make you want more. Yeah, absolutely. Now you have a, a, a process, I guess, a method that you've put in the book. And I really like this one. Uh, it's called the bookend method. Yes. I'm glad you like that. I, <laughs> I do like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was, I was, I have an um, online membership for health and I was putting together um, one of our monthly bundles. And I was just thinking about morning and evening routines because I'd been getting a lot of questions about this. And I think there were some confusions. We all have heard probably by now that it's really great to have a morning routine and then an evening routine. But I think people were getting confused with what those things are. And I started talking about, it's really important to bookend your day with, even if it's 10 minutes, you know, five, 10 minutes, you know, maybe 30 minutes, whatever it is, everyone's different of intentional self-care because that sets you up to make better choices during the day. And what came out of that is the bookend method. And really what the bookend method is, is like I just said, you have something in the morning, a morning routine or ritual, even if it's just five minutes. I know a lot of people, they have kids, they have jobs, there's so much happening. You don't have to spend two hours every morning in a morning ritual. 10 minutes, 15 minutes that you can in the morning, 10 or 15 minutes in the evening. And they have different purposes. In the morning, you want to choose things that increase your energy 
that set you up to make great choices during the day. And in the evening, you need to set yourself up for better sleep. So they actually have different purposes and they're not interchangeable. But in the morning, and and there are some things that you can do in both of them, you know, journaling, some type of meditation, whether it's mantra-based meditation or mindful med- mindfulness meditation, even just deep breathing, stretching. There are some overlap, but really in the morning, how can you health-wise set yourself up to make better choices during the day? Because we know that how you start something affects every choice that you make. It's why if you look at, if anybody's ever done theater or you know something in a theater group, there's always a prayer circle before the big show. It's how you start something. It's why uh, in sports teams, there's always the big huddle before the show, right? How we start something dictates how it goes during the day. So if in the morning, if you can just commit to 10 to 15 to 30 minutes of a very mindful, intentional health practice, you will make better choices during the day. And that brings us to the evening. If you can dedicate five, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is to setting yourself up to sleep better, sleep is so critical to health. But I would even say sleep is as critical to health as what you eat. I think sleep is completely underrated um, and quality sleep, right? Not junk sleep where you're you know, tossing and turning, you can't sleep at night. Um, and there are things you can do to set yourself up to sleep much better. I've been on a quest for better, better sleep for the last 10 years and I'm finally sleeping really well. But yeah, just bookending your day with two practices can make a world of difference in your health. Right. So now someone gets your book because you know, there's lots of, there's a lot in here uh, of different things that we can do, different approaches. And so uh, someone starts setting goals and, and getting action and they're starting to develop these habits. In the book, you go through a series of tools that we can use to help us stick to the habits. In other words, quite a bit there. So I, you know, I don't want to ask you to share all of it. Uh, yeah, but yeah. You, but you go through just a few of, of your favorite tools that would help us stick to the healthy habits that we're getting. Yeah, there are. There's quite a few in here. I think one of the biggest things, just the mindset shift of the crowd out method, meaning instead of if you're, if you're on the quest for healthier habits and you want to start with food, think about adding things in, not taking things out. So again, that's kind of the moderator abstainer model where, you know, people want to be gluten-free or dairy-free or vegan or whatever it is, which is not a bad thing. But what that model does is it removes things where the crowd out method introduces things. So instead of telling yourself, like, I can't have, you know, tacos or whatever it is that you want, add things in say, you know, I'm going to eat a giant bowl of veggies or salad or whatever it is, something that, you know, is healthier. I'm going to eat this. I'm going to bring things in instead of taking things out. And that will naturally crowd out the bad things. I think that's one of the best places people can start for healthy eating. Instead of saying, I can't ever have something again, say, what will I have today? And if I still want that other thing, sure. And usually, you know, you're full by the time you have the thing that you said you were going to have. So you don't even want the other thing. I think the crowd out method is absolutely key to building healthier habits. I think something else that's really, really important. We alluded to social media a little bit. I love social media. I use it. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. I think social media is a great way to connect. But I also, um, you know, throughout the book, what something I'm really encouraging people to do is to understand that how you do one thing is how you do everything. And that's why I talk about environment and I talk about, you know, detoxing your laundry and all these different things, because how you do one thing ends up to be how you do everything. So if you want to change your food habits and you're having a difficult time making great choices, start in other areas of your life, right? Once you start to clean up other areas of your life, it's easier to clean up your food. So one thing would be curating your social media feed. I, you know, have gone through periods of time where I'm following someone, even a friend, someone who I know, and I just find myself comparing myself to that person a lot. You can curate your social media feed unfollow accounts. You don't have to unlike, or, you know, it doesn't have to be with any haste, but you can mute accounts. You can unfollow accounts. Don't let your social media feed be filled with things that make you feel less because if you're allowing, it's that little tick in your mind. Every time you see that, that brings you down. And of course, the more you feel down, the worst choices you're going to make. Yeah. I took, I took one of my, I I took one of my work, uh, related, uh, Twitter accounts. And I just went through and I said, okay, if someone posts something political, I'm just going to unfollow them. Mm. And I did that for like three days. And after about three days, there were, there was no political posts on my Twitter feed for, you know, when I was working during the day. So if I went to check Twitter, 
I wasn't getting bombarded by all the political conversations. So it became a very peaceful, zenful <laughs> feed <Yeah. laughs> because it was filled with, with people who were positive and, and talking about health and wellness and not going off on those daily tangents of negativity that were starting to impact the way I, I felt about the world. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going when I'm, when I'm doing this, I want to think about health and fitness. I want to think about wellness. I want to think about joy. And, and I'm not getting it from these people, even though a lot of what they put out there was extremely valuable. It was just, it was just, I wanted, I needed to get rid of that other piece. And so when I did that, it's like that feed is my kind of my little go-to Zen place. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll log in there and just read what people are saying there rather than other places, because I know I'm just going to get hit and bombarded with things that are going to just be negative. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, no one, no two people's social media feeds are identical because the algorithms know based on what, even if you slow down to scroll, even if you don't like something, they know what you like or that you're, you they, they know where your attention goes. And then your feed is filled with more of those things. So I've, I've heard from a lot of women who are like, Oh, have you seen this? It's all over Facebook. And I'm like, I haven't even seen that. And like, you like it because you're going to websites that are talking about that and you're liking things. You're slowing down on those posts. So they're giving you more of that. So I, I really, you know, especially women who are newer to social media in the past, like five or 10 years, the reason your, your feed looks like that, no one else's does. It's because you're gravitating towards that. And you can curate that. You can change that by unfollowing or unliking things and then really making sure that you're liking or commenting on things that lift you up. You know, your social media feed really should be a place that gives you inspiration and lifts you up. If you're ever feeling down after you look at your social media feed, you need to curate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, you know, a big thing too is that I would leave people with is that good health is not all or nothing. And I think we are bombarded with the idea that if you do one thing that's not on your plan, it's all for naught. And that's not true. Your health changes in cycles and seasons in life. You'll change, you know, the average person eats around 2000 times a year. If you're eating like three to five times a day, let's say you're going to eat 1500 to 2000 times in a year. And I don't know a lot of people who can get something 1500 out of 1500 or 2000 out of 2000, right? That that's, you know, I, I know some pretty high performers and I don't know if I can find anybody that doesn't, there's not any error in that. So you know, I think what we need to understand is that we constantly need to be moving the needle towards better health. I do believe that we need to eat real food. We need to, we need to learn what it feels like to feel good because once you feel good, you don't slide back into unhealthy habits and recognize that we should be always searching for progress, not perfection, because perfection is in the complete illusion. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Now, I don't want that to be a get out of jail free card to just, you know, go eat fast food or something because yeah. we need to stay away from food that is harmful to us. But good health is not all or nothing. So if you are at, you know, your sister's house or your friend's house and they make this big feast and it's not necessarily within the way that you eat and you want to enjoy the party with people, go ahead and do it. It's what you do the next day and the next day and the next day. It's not one meal that's going to sabotage everything that you've done. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, you know, something I've been paying a lot more attention to really in about the last two years, particularly since I started writing my book um, back a ways, it was mm -hmm. that words have such a profound meaning beyond what you would just attribute to them if you were reading a book. You know, like if you're reading through a sentence and the word I can't comes up, Mm. Uh, you know, it just seems like a simple word, but you know, for, for the person like you, that's a moderator. And this is, this is one of your, your hints here or your tools is, is to replace, I can't with, I don't. Yes. Yes. This is another scientifically proven mindset trick that takes the pressure off the burden off or the heaviness off of, you know, Oh, I can't have ice cream after dinner. Whenever you tell yourself you can't do something, it is going to be at the forefront of your mind with, I don't eat ice cream after dinner, or I don't eat ice cream after dinner unless it's Friday. Sure. On Fridays, whatever, whatever day you pick, maybe you like your ice cream on Tuesdays. Um, or maybe you make your own. There's a recipe on my blog for healthy homemade ice cream out of coconut milk. That's really low in sugar. And you want to have some of that every night after dinner, go for it. For me, I use time-restricted eating. I generally don't eat after seven o'clock. 
So for me, it's not that I can't eat after seven o'clock. Sure, if I'm hungry, I can't eat. I just don't eat after seven o'clock. And I don't do that. And again, as a moderator, intermittent fasting is proven to work if you do it at least five days per week. So on the weekends, sure, if I'm invited out, I'm not going to tell my friends, well, I'm not going to eat after seven, right? So I, I still have that balance and that flexibility in my lifestyle. But in general, when I'm at home, I don't eat after seven. And just that simple trick of using I don't instead of I can't puts you back in the driver's seat and it gives you a position of power instead of a position of, well, I can't have that. Yeah. And, and the mindset is is so critical in this. That's why I really liked that tool was because I think a lot of folks just feel so restricted when they go in and say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and try this vegan diet. And, and they're not thinking of it as a way of eating. They do see an endpoint there, but now they're like, well, I, I can't have a hamburger. And then, so now they're in the, the, the shop looking for fake burgers, uh, you know, to kind of appease this thing. And, and, and so it, it kind of sends them down the spiral path of I can't, and I can't, and I can't, and they just want it that much more. Right. Right. Absolutely. Now I define wellness as being the healthiest fittest and happiest you can be? What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Oh man, I think that so much of it has to do with mindset. I, I, if I could pick three things, two of them would probably be mindset based because if, again, if we're just, if we're skipping the mindset piece and then we're just going straight into the food, we're always going to stop at some point. It has to be mindset based. I think the first thing for women that I've noticed that I would say is in getting your mindset right is realizing that you are constantly changing and evolving and nothing is ever set in stone. If you want to be vegan your whole life, great. And that works. I think it's great. But what works more, I think for a lot of women is that to understand, I mean, women are cyclical by nature, right? We have our, our cycles by nature. You might want to eat different at different points in your cycle every month. You might feel better vegan meat free one week and you might realize that you need a little bit more protein and you gravitate towards animal protein another week. Also the seasons change. The seasons are cyclical, right? Um, you might find that in the summer you like more raw uncooked food and in the winter you gravitate towards more, you know, heavier cooked food. And then the cycles and seasons of your life change, right? You know, the teenagers, the adolescents, then we turn into a, you know, young adulthood into this like more mature area of life. So the first thing for women, what I would say in order to be healthy and well is realize that you are free to change course at any point in your life. And that's a mindset trick. You are free to make a change. If you've been labeling your eating habits and that no longer feels good to you, you are completely free to change anything in your life. So I think that would be the first thing is just realizing that life is cyclical and you can make a change at any point. Um, the second thing to be healthy and well, I would say is to visualize it. And that goes back to the vision board and create an environment. So this is mindset and, you know, starting to get into like something physical you can do. You have to create an environment that supports your healthy lifestyle. And that has to do with how you, you know, whatever's in your home, whatever, however you set up your day, you've got to create an environment for yourself that feels good to be healthy and well. Because if you don't have the environment to support your lifestyle, it's going to feel very, very difficult to be healthy and well. And I think the third thing is just really goes back to food, understanding that there's one, not one right way for everyone. So stop searching for a silver bullet diet because it doesn't exist um, and really just follow the qualitarian way. Those would be the three things that I would tell people. I really appreciate those. Those were excellent. Thank you. So if someone wanted to learn more about you, and the book, The Health Habit, where would you like for me to send them? Oh yeah, um, my website, elizabethrider.com. And there are over 300 recipes there. There are a ton of healthy living resources. And with the book coming out, we are giving away down free downloadable book bonuses um, with checklists, downloads, cleanup items. There's so many fun things to download with the book. And that's at elizabethrider.com forward slash book, or it's really easy to find on my website, but I would love to send everyone there so they can grab those bonuses with the book. Outstanding. Well, this is going to be episode 395. So you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 395. And I'll be sure to have the links right there. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being a part of 40 plus fitness. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I appreciate it. Let me ask you a question. Have you lost your edge? You just not feel as sharp as you used to and things aren't going your way at work or in life. 
Maybe you just lack the energy you once had that got you where you are and you want to get that back. If this is you, go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash edge. I made a short little video for you. I think you're really going to like. 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash edge. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, I share the nine most common diet mistakes. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.